Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host Ollie Fisher, joined once again by Anthony Targrew, back after a week absence. What's up guys, glad to be back. Um, I'm here again and we got a not fun game and a fun game to talk about, so can't wait for the latter. And we have Yeah, well I was for... wondering what we were talking about this week, so thanks for bringing my mood down a little bit. Down and what? then back up, you know. Yeah, yeah right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. Um, if, if you're wondering why the podcast looks back to normal after last week, it's because we've got our proper operator here for the backgrounds and for the banners. Uh, last week was a bit of a... It stands out when you look at it on the YouTube. Um, I was in charge of that. I fucked up. So I apologise um, on behalf of everyone. Um, but yeah, we, we've got AJ back and he's he's in command of all this stuff and, and now it looks normal again. I think so. the best part is, is like during like one of like the intermission things, I guess, I was talking to Oliver, I go, is AJ's face always covered up with the banner? And he's like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and we're like, all right. I well, if I'll you guys like that, that background, that is the bonus background. So, you know, subscribe to our sub stack and you get to see it that way every week on Fridays. Perfect segue into um, into the Substack. Thank you, as always, to our founding members, Des Windsor, McGlynn, Ali, Serene, Tito, Matt, Moritz, Pullman, Joey Gawler, Kemin, MJ, and Matt. We've got eight names on there at the moment. Um, if you want me to, to struggle to read lots of names in, in one sentence, then um, get yourself subscribed as a, as a founding member. Uh, we have got a lot of interesting stuff on the Substack. We've got regular series uh, such as Meeting the Milan Media, Lone Watch, um, got an, a weekly newsletter, a weekly deep dive article, and also um, for the first time in the last few days, we had a fir- a, like a first access thing for some exclusive transfer news that we had um, regarding our interest in a, in a Bologna player. Um, so there's plenty of reasons to, to go and subscribe, and you can always check it out for a week for free. Um, and thank you to those who have. Yeah, as has kind of been mentioned, we've got a, a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. Not that again. Uh, I still don't know who was the good one and who was the bad one, but yeah, um, we, we've got a bit of a negative and a bit of a positive two, three, one games to talk about. So there's at least a bit of consistency in that. But we start with the uh, game last midweek against Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League. Uh, we've got a new background for the Champions League thing. Um, we're, we're smaller and we're in the middle. If you if you're watching um, <laughs> on YouTube, you will see it. If you're listening, then you've you. <laughs> You, you just got to take our word for it, but it's so you can see the Champions League stars at the top. So you can tell it's a Champions League themed background. You have to see the stars. Um, you've got to see them, man. You know, everyone knows it. It's iconic. Um, and it's good that we did this in our second last game of the Champions League. Mm-hmm. Eh? Because we are on our way out, boys. We are on our way out and we are probably going to finish bottom of the group. Well, this didn't go well. Like experimenting for next season, right? So mm, next yeah. season we have everything ready for what we're the Europa fingers League. crossed, man. It's still the early. Europa League next season. Yeah. Um, oh, look, we knew what was at stake coming into this game. It it was pretty much a must win in terms of keeping qualification in our hands going into the final game. Um, a draw, as it turns out, wouldn't have been that great a result. But um, did, uh, Dortmund came in in this game top of the group, but I think most people before the uh, before a ball was kicked and when they saw the draw, thought Dortmund at home might be the easiest fixture, along with Newcastle at home, and the one that we could target for three points. After we beat PSG at home, we come into this, we're confident, we've beaten Fiorentina in the league uh, straight after the international break, and we all predict. well, me and Maddie predicted a win in la- in the preview podcast, and it just... It- it it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. Like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And I guess we start chronologically with uh, a penalty won by Samuel Chukwueze, who had a good game. That was one of the few mm-hmm. positives. Um, a penalty won by him, shot blocked with the arm. I think one of the replay angles shows that it was the correct decision. And Olivier Giroud misses his second ever penalty for us out of like 13 or something. I think something it is. Like that, yeah. yeah um, that kind of set the tone in the end. Yeah, um, I mean, not really much <laughs> on that. Um, five minutes in, we're like, oh, we got a penalty. Cool. Like, we finally got a penalty. It's been forever. We got one against Fiorentina right before, and we're like, cool. Now we're back into this this uh, kind of cycle of getting uh, good decisions for us. Then we miss it, and it was like, okay, whatever. We're dominating, though, for the first five minutes. Like, we look good. And then three minutes after that, we give away a penalty, and they do put it away. So um, that kind of just set the tone right there it's just 
you go into that and you're like, ah, okay, now now we have the climb. We had to overcome the deficit and we had to go ahead. And I don't remember when Chukwueze scored. Was it the 41st minute? Something yeah, it was like a few that. minutes before halftime. It was a beautiful yeah. goal. Fantastic goal. goal. Incredible goal. And, you know, it's got to be said, he was playing out of his mind. That was the best Chukwueze game I think we've we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, then, unfortunately, he went back to, you know, not, not so hot <laughs> the game after. But... Uh, no, but yeah, we I mean, saw what he can do. So, you know. Yeah. And and I was Keep really excited for him and I was happy to see it. So I was like, okay, maybe this is his, you know, coming out party. He's he's on top of it. And uh it really sucks when that's your debut goal for a club, or I guess not debut, but his first goal for the club. Mm -hmm. Fantastic performance. And the scoreline is a three one defeat. You know, right. he, he came out looked, looked great, and then the second half, it just Dortmund were the far better side and i don't feel like we ever got back into it there's yeah. a reason they're top of the group yeah they were they're like the team, team that no one was really worried about because mm. you know dortmund hasn't done much over the past four seasons but not for the past couple um but sometimes in, in the champions league they just hit in this mm. season they hit so yeah um when, yeah there was a there was there was a stat as well about like how many times in a row dortmund have reached the knockout stages and it's quite a few, you know, like they're no mugs. They're experienced in this competition because they finished top four in, in Germany pretty much every season. Um, before this game, they were 10 points behind the league leaders in the Bundesliga. So I think a few people were looking at it thinking, well, you know, they can focus more on Europe now. They're basically out of the title race there. Um, and and they've been, Edin Terzic, who's like a young and I guess promising head coach, has managed to get a real tune out of him. Like to beat Newcastle home and away is a big deal. Um, and he he's gotten playing this this I don't know it's like a compact style it's kind of what you'd expect from a German team where they're happy to let you have the ball because they're going to hurt you at the other end and that is exactly what they did um, they countered ruthlessly they exposed everything that we didn't want them to I think it was a naive naive sort of tactical <laughs> game by us in general to be honest um, and it, it does start from that from that penalty that we gave away inside the opening. Uh, 10 15 minutes, you know, we we left Calabria exposed one on one against Bino Gittens. He did the hard part by showing him outside, and you, you got to say, let him get the cross in, and then if they score, it's not your fault anymore. Instead, he takes a random swipe at him and clips him to the floor. No complaints that it was a penalty, but as the captain, you can't be doing that, you can't be diving in naively like that. He had a horrible game. He was getting smoked yeah, really by bad game. everyone, every really bad every one on one he got. I mean. After praising him for his Frosinone game, his PSG games, and whatever game was before Frozenone that. Frosinone was this weekend. Napoli, so. he did okay. Yeah, was, sorry. Well, I was thinking Frosinone because we're going to talk about but, uh, Fiorentina. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The previous games, he was looking really good, and then he came in here and just stunk it out. Yeah. It was, That's kind of how bad. he is, though, right? Like, yeah. when he's on, he's on. But when he's off, whoo, get him off. Right? Yeah, and people exactly. Are, people are probably looking at the, you know, he's, I'm not going to say he dealt with Mbappe because he had some help from Tamori, but he always seems to come out on top against Cavaricelli, for example. Like he, he seems to thrive on these big battles. And then you look at who's starting for Dortmund on the left wing, and not many people have heard, and this isn't disrespectful, it's just a fact because he's a kid, but not many people have heard of Jamie Bino Gittens. Like they're thinking, well, Calabria probably shouldn't have a problem on that side. Mm -hmm. Fucking rinsed him, man. Every single time it was him and Hummels were the best two players on the pitch. Um, and hey, yeah. like a mental rule by... that if there's a player on Dortmund that you haven't heard of, he's probably going to be really good because he'll be leaving in a couple seasons. Right. And if yeah. you've heard of them, it means they've been there for a long time. You know what I yeah, mean? He's an, he's an England That's youth actually a really good as point. well. <laughs> he's um, he he signed for them from Man City's academy that winger. Okay. So you know it, it goes to show, doesn't it? I think Milan should do that. To be honest, just look at City's academy and see who we can tempt to come over. Uh, literally, because what another gem they've got there. Um, but yeah, that it was. It was. Look, let's be honest. Um, Chuck with a goal aside, fantastic moment. Really happy for him. Um, questionable defending, like he was shown to the byline by two players who then left a gap for him to run through. But um, he took it well. He hit it low into the corner. He he, he didn't try go top corner, which I think would have probably seen the ball end up in the stands. So a nice composed finish. Hopefully. Um, he, he, he did regress a bit in the next game, but hopefully it's the start of something something a bit better for him. Um, first half, we went on top. First few minutes of the second half as well, we were on top. Uh, we had the momentum, and it looked like if there was going to be a winner, it was going to be us. And then 
Malik Chow is running towards the byline and he pulls up instantly, pulling the back of his leg. I completely forgot about that. Oh, shit. Yeah. That really did it, huh? That was it. I mean, they scored like er, like 53 minutes into the second half, something like that. 59 and 69 59. is when they scored. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it wasn't nice. that long in, but that was the turning point. Obviously, we don't have any other center backs at all. And uh, mm. we had only one other defender on the bench in Florenzi, but Peely opted to bring on Krunic and play him as a center back. And as we saw based on the goals, like they weren't entirely Krunic's fault, but he was a part of the equation for those. Uh, he just, He's not a center back. He shouldn't be doing that. I mean, he shouldn't Is be. Is he even a footballer? Huh. Barely, barely. If he's he seen Fenerbahce, that movie, he's worth three and a half million. Yeah. <laughs> like in the in the um twenty 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 one season, uh, I remember him starting left wing and stuff like that, uh, including against Verona when he scored that magical free kick, and then he got sort of playing attacking midfield, then box to box, started the season as a number six. Now we're seeing him put his centre back in the Champions League. Like I don't know what the hell has gone on. Uh, with Krunic, but he's getting further away from goal. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you said, and it is right, we didn't have another senior defender on the bench apart from uh, Florenzi. So the option, I guess, would have been to bring Florenzi on at right back and move Calabria inside. Or I guess you could bring on Florenzi at left back and move Teo inside as we ended up having to do in the next game, which we'll talk about. But we did have Bartizagi. Um, and I would have considered bringing him on at left centre back and, and moving Tamori across uh, because he's got size to deal with um, what was essentially then a Dortmund front four. Um, but they took advantage of it. You know, that, that second goal to make it 2 1 scored by Bino Gittens was a really good goal. You know, they moved it from right into the middle of the box, 1 2. Um, Krunic, Calabria follows the man inside and leaves his own man at the at the far post and and yeah he sweeps it in to make it 2-1 and that was the moment the game was lost i i didn't see us coming back from that and it proved to be the yeah. case um yeah. and then what's that, the third that goal? i was just gonna agree with you really the third goal was from out of yemi oh, yeah. and he yeah, fucking yeah. smoked us i don't like I, I mean obviously you've seen him play before right he's one of the few people you do know at, at dortmund and he's quick we know that but that was the first time where i ever watched him play and thought damn this guy you know like he was good he just made it look easy and um yeah i mean credit to him like i, I can't take anything away from their performance normally there's something that i could bitch about and, and say mm -hmm. it's not our fault but nah actually no the injury the injury it's not our fault <laughs> that's it but, him so but adayemi fucking man good for him yeah he, 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 him. he yeah. how old is he now he he, i feel like he's been around a while 24 ish, I would say. He, he's another one who came through the through the Red Bull system. He he was um very good at Salzburg, and then and then he got his move. Uh, mm -hmm. but he was a striker there. Um, and he's he came on as a left winger, and he has been playing a fair bit as a winger for for Dortmund. Just has just as Marlon, who was at PSV Eindhoven, and we were linked with when he was a striker, has been playing quite a lot on the right wing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they got this thing of moving strikers out wide, but for for whatever reason, I guess with the athleticism and pace that they've got and a, a fierce shot as well, it seems to work. Um, Mania had a little at fault for that third goal. I think he he got to it, um, and he decided to he got a fist to it rather than going two hands at it. He just went one fist at it, and it it squirmed behind him. It, and yeah, it, it looked like you know obviously it was it was going low, and it looked like he went for it, and it just bounced underneath his hand somehow, and. And credit to Mignon for getting up and, and diving to swat it out. Obviously, it, it had crossed the line. Um, but I, I guess that's one thing. But it, you know what? I don't even want to give him credit for that because ultimately it is kind of his fault that that went in. Like, it was straight at him. It was a savable shot for someone that we've we've said is a top five goalkeeper in the world for a couple of years now. Like, you need to be saving that shot. And I think he's been at fault for a lot of goals lately, or, or at least partially at fault. So, hmm. His regression has been real. Um, I know he had a crazy fever in the, the Fiorentina game and supposedly wasn't still at 100% for this one, um, but didn't have any excuse for, for Osinone. You know, we'll talk about that next, but he, he could have done better on a few of those goals or on that one goal as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I've been a little uh, less impressed by Mike this year. I think the entire team, though, is doing that. It's not just Mike. Yeah. 
great. So. Yeah, he's not. He, yeah, he, he's not. Yeah, had, um, I agree. Anything solid in front of him, has he? To be honest, but um, but yeah, he, he's still a goalkeeper that will win us more points than he costs us. I do believe that. But on the biggest stages, you know, you you can't you can't that that put the game to bed. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, he, he will have the po- the finger pointed at him. Uh, especially if he wants to make a salary in line with the top goalkeepers in the world. Um, that's it, I guess. We, we the, the remainder of the game was played out exactly how you'd expect. Uh, Dortmund were happy to let us have the ball, but we didn't really do anything with it. And Luka Jovic hit the post. I, I suppose that was signs of life for, for what was to come against Frosinone. Um, but that yeah, that was about it. I, 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 think, I think it was this group, dubbed the group of death, whatever... Optimistic fans were saying we we could finish top, and and pessimistic fans or realistic fans, whatever way you want to look at it, were saying um, that that we could also finish bottom. Um, I think it's looking like we probably will finish bottom now. I think it'll be very tough to go to Newcastle and 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 get a result. Um, we have to win to guarantee Europa League football. Uh, we have to win to have a chance of reaching the round of sixteen. But we've got to hope that Dortmund beat PSG. Dortmund have no obligation to beat PSG. They're already through. Um, so I, I think everything's stacked up uh, towards us crashing out in the group stages. And do you guys want in Europa League? I'll take whatever. You know, like it's the one trophy we haven't won as a club. So <laughs> if we can get it, cool. You know, it's it's a trophy to celebrate. Um, you see what that's done for Inter over the last two seasons, winning what we would consider two meaningless trophies, but they've done it two years in a row now, and 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 they're in the position that they're in. So. I'd take a trophy, but it's not my priority, Europa League. Um, mm. in, in the preseason predictions, I did say that I think we would crash out. Obviously, that was before the groups were announced, but just knowing that we were going to be pot four, I figured we would get the the toughest group. And I think the irony is that the only game we won so far was against the team that we definitely said, okay, well, that's six points drop. So I don't yeah. know. It, it, it's just been a crazy group. But yeah, I'm, with the injuries, it's probably a blessing. Um, mm. You just you never want to root for... A European exit, obviously. So, yeah, and the money it would cost, and um, you wait for coefficient points, like people talking about us being in the lower pots for this draw again, and, and what it costs you. Well, crashing out of Europe entirely before Christmas also costs you ranking points. So we'd probably be in the same position again next year. Um, but that's probably something for a bonus podcast. Maybe we could debate the pros and cons of dropping into the Europa League. Um, top some flops have, from the uh, game. Go on. No, I was gonna say we should have Stefan for that one since he's. Um really really knowledgeable on like how rankings are decided who is that yeah brilliant uh, <laughs> tops and flops i, I think chukwes is the obvious top and i think calabri is the obvious flop we move i would totally agree with that for yep. all the reasons we've said maddie do you agree yep right, right let's move on europe's shit and overrated from dortmund to frosinone this was a bit like um what is it? What's the saying? After the Lord Mayor's show, like we, we had the big event on Tuesday night and it was an absolute damp squib. So we were coming into this and I, I personally wasn't even looking forward to this game because it's like there's, there's, there's so little to, to win aside from the three points, but there is so much to lose. You know, there's all the rumours building up to this game about Pioli's job never being as at risk as it is after that Dortmund game and the probable exit from Europe um, at the first hurdle. And the selection problems that we knew about, Liao and Giroud being out, Chiao being out for probably looking like three months. So uh hope he has a very a very stable recovery and doesn't need an operation, as the, there was some talk about. Um but yeah, the the team that we were forced to field, uh I, I think the starting lineup was probably the main headline from this, to be honest. Manian in goal, Calabria, um, Tamari and Teo as the centre backs, and then Florenzi as the left back. Um, and then the the midfield now looking like our first choice midfield, and then Chukwueze and Pulisic as the wingers, and and Luka Jovic getting another start up front. What did you think when you saw that back four? I was, I was yeah, I was interested. You know, I want I want to see let's, how this works out. Um, I, I didn't think like I, I so before that came out, I jokingly said because uh, the quote from Pioli, I'm going to try something in defense you haven't seen before. So I'm thinking, okay, like what crazy plan has this man concocted? And and yeah. I jokingly said it's going to be a three-five-two with Calabria and Teo as, as center backs. And 
got a little bit of that right, and I wasn't too thrilled. Um, but honestly, like, and we'll obviously end on tops and flops, but I think Teo's a candidate. I, I thought he did mm-hmm. really well. You, I've never seen an attacking center back before. Maybe someone else has, but he still got forward from center from center back, which was crazy. And uh, I guess a big plus is he's so fast that it never felt like there was an actual gap there. Mm. Obviously, the the instruction was that when he does get forward, one of the midfielders gets back, which is how it's always been anyway. So <laughs> yeah. it wasn't too different. And I think his heat map, he still drifted left quite a bit. Um, so it, it was almost like we actually played one center back and two left backs. But it, it worked out. Yeah. So I wasn't obviously this is frozen on You know, it's this isn't like a giant where we're yeah, like, but wow, based what on a revelation. We've been but, playing like this is yeah, yeah exactly change, it, right? Yeah. It was a two it was a total free hit for them as well. Like they they've just been promoted from Serie B. They won the league last year. They spent four million euros in the summer and and sold 13 million worth of players. Like there's no big overhaul here. They were expected to be in a relegation battle. I think I picked them to go down. And they were in 10th coming into this game, having won three of their last four. So they were coming here like, let's let's do a job on them. And, right. You know, they're, they're low on confidence. They don't have much debt. And I was a bit disappointed with them, but that's that's another story, really. I just thought coming into this game, their main threat and, and a player that I, I take on Milan in a heartbeat is Sula on the right wing. Mm-hmm. You know, he scored six goals this season, which for um, not a high scoring team is, is impressive. Obviously, he's on loan from Juventus. Um and, and he's been playing on the right-hand side. What you can do is pick your first choice right, uh, left-hand side of the defence. So you can have Teo and Tamari in their usual positions, and then you can play Simic in Calabria, for example. And, and you just kind of hope that nothing really comes from that side and they play through Sula, as they have been doing. Um, so I was surprised that he decided to weaken the left side by playing a fullback on his weaker side, who has was, who was historically struggled defending mm-hmm on the wrong side because of your body position and showing players inwards versus outwards. And then, yeah, Teo was a centre-back. Um, Teo was like Rude Hullet at Chelsea when he used to play centre-back, but he, he didn't play centre-back. He basically just used to yeah. play midfield, at, like, before. Um, but it was it was kind of cool to see. Um, thankfully, Sula had one of his less threatening games. Um, they they Frosinone weren't that great. Um, I, I thought that they might at least outrun us because of the extra rest that they have compared to us. But um, it was basically a, a matter, of, not a matter of time. It was just a matter of getting the first goal before half time, before the stadium became really restless and um, the pressure started to dial up. And it came through Jovic. And it was a beautiful volley, too. Like, it, was. it certainly was. I actually laughed when it happened. I was like, ha ha ha, you know, <laughs> like. I was fucking laughing because you just don't expect yeah, but it. You know him. that like in the past three seasons, if that was like CDK or any like uh, Macias or Rigi, it's going wide or just way over the bar. Right. Yeah. So, and I think that's one thing that Jovic has shown in most games with us is that he does have a good shot. Like he, he hit the target on that one. Or I'm sorry, not the target, the the post. Uh, he hit post twice actually, hasn't he this yeah. season? He did mm-hmm. go for a bicycle kick that I think also hit, either hit crossbar or was saved or something. He had that one on one where he shot it straight at the keeper. But like the point being, he's not whiffing shots, sending them sky high like every other backup striker we've signed over the last three four seasons. So you know there have been signs, and as much as we made fun of Pioli for saying it. Um, I think it was in the frozen. Or, God, I, can't, I keep mixing them up. Fiorentina game. So um, he said, you know, Jovic had a good game, and we all were like, no, the fuck, he didn't. But he kind of did. You know, he he had. I think he had the through ball that won the penalty. Maybe yeah. or was that Chukwueze? I can't remember. Um, I think it was Jovic. Maybe maybe it was Jovic. Yeah, I, I don't remember. But so he he did well, and then he hit the crossbar or he hit the post and then now he's got a goal and assist this game. So like there is that steady improvement. And I'm not saying like, yo, which is the guy, you know, start him. Don't do that. But he had a really good game. And I think we're seeing a lot more from him now. And now we have three strikers this season who have scored goals, which is um, something we haven't said in a long time, but I just like the, the storylines from this game, right? Like obviously Teo as a center back is a big storyline. Um, I, I want to interject at that yeah, point yeah, yeah. and say um, 
Teo, it was revealed by Pioli after the game that Teo went to him in training and said, I think I can do it. I mean, I'm willing to do it. And fair folks, because we talked, I, I've particularly berated the team for showing a lack of leadership this season or for the leaders not showing up. And for him to say, I'm willing to play out of position and basically sacrifice everything that makes me tick as a player, those forward mm. runs and stuff like that, uh, for the good of the team. Yeah, fair enough. And, and, and looking at him, I know he's not the 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 tallest or the biggest or whatever. He didn't look out of place physically as a centre-back. No. Like I, I, I don't want to see it ever again because that means that we've got another injury crisis, yeah. you know? But it, it it didn't look that bad. And and fair fair play. Um, Happy for Teo. And yeah, sorry, you were saying Jovic. Yeah, no, I just... Um, so that's one of the storylines is Teo as a centre-back. Um, mm. Jovic, with statistically the worst season of his entire career going into this game. First time he ever went eight games without a goal. And then to pop off with a goal and assist this game. Um, on, on the Frozenone side, obviously their goal scorer is on loan from us in Brescia Nini. Um, they have a center back named Romagnoli, who's not our Romagnoli, but he's returning kind of. They got a forward I'm named Ibrahimovic. Ibrahimovic. You know, yeah. like it's just kind of a fun little game. So I, I don't know. This one was enjoyable. The first 40 minutes leading up to the goal, pretty boring. Not a whole lot happened. But as soon as we got that first goal, it was like everyone said, oh, shit, we are footballers. We can play this sport. We know what we're doing. And obviously, Jovic goal, great volley. Halftime comes right after halftime, 50 minutes in. Menyan gets another assist, his uh, fourth in three years, something like that, in, in the league. Yeah. Great three, ball. Three straight obviously. seasons with a league assist, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um Pulisic's touch on that was incredible. Just yeah, like that was <laughs> from what sixty meters? You think that sixty point seven meters? They said yeah. So that's a good estimation. Yeah, I, was, I didn't know there was an official thing, but okay. <laughs> yeah, we just saw that on Twitter. I don't know. I, I got the lineup. That's it. I don't have anything. I'm right here just <laughs> yeah, fucking rambling. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, yeah, but Pulisic got that <laughs> fantastic touch. Obviously scored it. Five goals. Madison, get that money ready for me. I will uh, happily pay you. So I will happily accept. Uh, so Pulisic, another goal, you know, love that. And more Mario Suma screaming, come on, baby, USA, USA. Uh, can't go wrong there. And then uh, what was it? Oh, and then Tamori, you know, Tamori get, gets a, a goal as well. Love that. I thought he deserves it. He's obviously been one of the best this season. So there's not enough shock in your voice when when talking about that Tamori goal. We actually executed a good corner routine. What the fuck is going on? Hell is frozen over somewhere, man. Oh, and, and uh, like who who started that? Who took that corner, by the way? It was a short corner to mm -hmm. the Teo then whipped him to the far yeah, post. Yeah, but, so, but who who took the corner though? I just want to know. I presume it was Pulisic, but yes, it was. He, he, is that even it's not even a hockey assist though, is it? Nope. Pulisic, nope. Teo, Teo, Jovic. Jovic, though, good. Peeling off run at the back post. Um, he ain't the biggest, but he actually does win quite a few uh, aerial duels. And he nodded that into a perfect area. We'd clearly drawn that one up on the training ground. And mm -hmm. that's what shocked me so much. It was it was a perfect routine. Um, three passes. They didn't even touch the ball. It ends up in net. And I'm always buzzing when Tamori scores, obviously, out of out of pure nationalism. But um, he... he he, whenever he scores, he goes mental. You can tell yeah. how much it means to him, you know. Um, that's why and, I don't think he's leaving crazy. for a long time. <laughs> I hope so. I, I hope that's the case. But yeah, that was the 3 0 goal. And then uh, we saw a couple of good moments off the bench, starting with uh, the return of Ishmael Benasser after oh. 206 days without yeah, a game. Glorious. Um, yeah, uh, he, he got an amazing ovation and after the game he said that it was quite emotional for him. Obviously, he spent seven months out basically after that uh, cartilage surgery in his knee. Um, I was at the game where he got injured and even I didn't think it was going to be as bad as what it turned out to be. Um, wasn't it uh, isn't... 206 days? 206 days, yeah. Um, it isn't even like a thing of, you know, you, you're bed bound for six months or anything like that. The frustrating thing for me would be like after three months, you can start jogging and stuff like that, but it's just rebuilding strength in your mm -hmm. muscles and getting back to, he looks to have like bulked out a bit muscle wise, you know, since he's been doing all of his strength and conditioning work, I imagine. But um, yeah, getting back to match fitness and stuff like that. He'd been training with the team for around about three weeks until we decided that he was ready to play 15 minutes. So that says a lot about what is required. And he's still there because his very first pass, as soon as he got the ball, his first pass split two lines to find uh, yep. 
what's his name, Jovic. So I mean, Jovic, he's yeah. to be, he's still fucking doing it, man. Like he's gonna come in and be our starter again. Like I was saying it earlier, we have not seen our starting eleven yet this season because yeah. Venice has been out, and I think it, it's probably gonna be Reinders, Benesser, and Loftus Cheek out. I think I'd rather be Musa, Loftus Cheek, and and Benesser, um, just because I feel like Musa is a lot more versatile and he can move in other places and i'm a biased yank so no i'm also a biased yank and he completed 100 percent of his passes this week who did musa yep 100 percent of his eight passes well done i was gonna say i don't remember a single thing he did but i accept <laughs> i take it he hit the post he was all right he yeah he the... didn't did pass he? the pool yeah. yeah but he was offside he, he went through on goal and he was, he was still amazing. Oh, right. like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, and he so didn't. Yeah. He should have squared yeah. it. He should have squared yeah. it. Where's the Yank Brotherhood, man? Where's all this independence? And you know what's funny is on the national team, he has a ton of assists given to Pulisic. Like they, they do oh, yeah. have that chemistry. I think he just wanted his first one, you know? He mm-hmm. just hasn't had uh, a goal yeah. yet. I'm, dude, when he scores, I'm going to go crazy. I know I'm you so are. <laughs> you, uh, uh, you mentioned I'm actually Pulisic. buy a jersey, even though I missed the free shipping on Black Friday. So I'll double okay. the cost for you then. <laughs> well done. Um, you mentioned Pulisic and, and that incredible first touch, which it was. I mean, that, that's something that you almost can't teach. Like that level of technique is what separates the best wingers in the world from from the. From Can you repeat shit. that again? No. Um, and then he, he <laughs> took it around. He took it around two men, and it was a good finish as well. Like the composure, because most people would hit that low and hope to get it under the goalkeeper, or they'd hit it as hard as they can towards the far corner. He kind of dinked it, or like he he sliced it into the top corner, mm-hmm. um, in in such a way that it was probably the only way it would have ended up in because there were two defenders running back towards the line, um, and it's his best start to a season for any club as well. Never before yeah. has he scored this many goals in in um the amount of appearances that he's got. I can't remember it was like thirteen or something like that. Oh, um, man. so absolutely chuffed to bits for him. Uh, good for him to get his fifth Serie A goal. Um, and well, the, and the reason his I, second goal I mentioned... ended up being the winner again. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, go on. That's it. Oh, the reason I mentioned kind of like being cheeky about it was who took that corner is because obviously he took the corner, so he he creates that goal. The the second goal he, he scored. Obviously, that was all Mike, but he he scored yeah. it. And then the first goal, I think he was like the fourth pass before the goal. Like he he did start the the attacking phase of that one as well. So you know he may not get the assist or the hockey on any of those, but. Uh, he you know, is you that can guy. say that Pula six goal is all Mike, but it takes oh. a winger with impeccable first touch skills to be You're able right. to trap that ball. It was all both of them. And you know what? That you separates know. the best wingers in the world from the, the rest of the pack, too. Yeah. So. Can you repeat that again so Steph said, can hear that? From, from, from the shit. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the among the best. The best wingers in the world is in like the world's population on a relative scale. So he like he's in the top two hundred wingers out of seven billion people. So you know, uh, well done to him. Um, I, I also, every, <laughs> every time Pulisic scores, we win five goals, five wins. Mm-hmm. So get him up front or something. Just make sure. You know, I had Pulisic a scores. AJ gets closer to like forty dollars or twenty dollars or something. 40. Pocket change. I bet you forty dollars. Yeah. But because it's a convoluted bet, it's 15 goals and assists for the season for Pulisic, but 10 of them have to be goals. If he hits 15 goal and assists, but he doesn't have 10 goals, then no, no one, no money exchanges hands. Dude, he's on track to get like 15 goals. I he hope is, so. Yeah. That'd be you're great. Not, you're gonna be getting. Well, I'll take it. 40 bucks. Yeah, but you're not factoring in the two month groin injury that he's gonna get around about January. Um, Who that seems to be part of the course. Yeah, um, but it was good. It was a routine win. Look, it wasn't a vintage performance. And yes, people will say that we relied on a bit of individualism again, but for apart from that set-piece goal. Um, however, it, it was a job done. It was professional. Um, and that's all you can hope for in games like that, that are potential banana skins. Tops and flops. Top for me, Luka Jovic. Good redemption story. I was I was happy with his overall play. I think the goal really sparked his confidence as well. Right place, right time, powerful finish. And from then, he, he looked fantastic. Obviously got the assist as well. Um, yeah, Jovic. Yeah, I think I'm going to give it to Jovic as well. Um, just because how many times are we going to say that this season? Probably mm-hmm. not a whole lot. So I'm going to give it to Jovic, but know that there is a very, very strong honorable mention for Christian Pulisic. 
Um, I'm going to do what I do every week and not pick an individual player, but a group. Our midfield combined 96% or more pass completions. When cool. our midfield is ticking, the rest of the team ticks. We talk about it every week about how they are just not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This week they did, and we won 3 1. So it just shows that when they play well, the team does. Mm-hmm. Mm. I like that. Nice. Block, tough one. Um, to be honest, because everyone performed to at least an okay level. I'm going to probably say Chukwese, just because I, w- I was hoping that he would kick on and, and threaten again at the very least after that goal that he got against Dortmund. But um, he looks a bit leggy to me. Like I know he's come back from an injury and he's basically started every game since. Um, but yeah, he, he didn't he didn't look as sharp as he did against Dortmund. So maybe that there's a fitness thing there. But yeah, I just expected more. So I'd say Chuk. Yeah, I think Chukwese is probably the right choice. Um, we we kind of skipped over it, but I do want to highlight Mignon in this one. Obviously, he had the assist, so uh, hard picking him, but the goal was so preventable. It was so, so preventable, and I feel like we're saying that every single week. With like, well, We're just not getting clean sheets anymore. We used to all the time. Yes, the defense has been worse, but this one was not the defense's fault. I believe it was from a set piece, either a free kick or a corner. I can't remember, but yeah. It, it was straight up, okay. Mike. Um, and also, this was the second game in, in three where he saved a shot with his face. And as funny <laughs> as that is, and as great as that is, that's not what a goalkeeper wants to do. They want to use their hands. They want to use their body, their their feet. The face is not what you're trying to save goals with. If you save the shot with your face, you missed where you were supposed to be your positioning. So I think he's... That's so harsh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's <laughs> true, though, right? <laughs> The, the Fiorentina one where Manjagora missed in the last minute, he literally knew nothing about it. He got he got in position and he just drilled it at his face. However, for that one, the one that he completely, uh, the, the one in this game that you're on about, the one where he was like, it, you just didn't see it. Like He just flew at him and then bounced off his head. That one I agree with, but I think the, the yeah. Fiorentina one's harsh. But I am going to pick Chukwese. I just, I just yeah, wanted to highlight funny. Mike's shortcomings this game because there were a few. Speaking I, of short, Maddie. What? <laughs> that was rude. Sorry. I didn't even hear what you said, but I'm going to go uh, Chuck as well. Excellent. Um, Kamada also came on. I forgot to mention that, but he didn't really do much apart from get hauled back. Uh, last man. He's got Not more really last games man, than judges in his career so far. I was so pissed off about that, though, because I thought, oh, wow, he's so slow. Like, he should be surging through on goal there. And then he the replay shows he's <laughs> He's like Chiellini on on Sterling, him, you know. Yeah. Like it was, it was really bad. Um, and it's the, a good learning experience for him, though. Man strength versus kid strength, I think. He yeah, he does need quick. to bulk up. Him and Shaka Traore, like to me, they both look like kids playing adults football, and they're not Crazy. really like Kamada is a kid, but um, Shaka's sort of been in and around for a while now. Um, it's a bit lazy to say, oh, they just need to bulk up, they need to put on a lot of weight, they need to get more top heavy and stuff like that, because that will come as they broaden, like w- when they grow. But also, like, that means that you've got to really be careful with the minutes that you give them because they're going to be put into situations where they can't physically compete at the moment. Um, so it was the right time to put them both on for this game when we were 3 0 up at the time. Um, however, yeah, I think it just shows that, that, that there is levels to it. And that's why loan spells might be important for both of them. Um, yeah, let's move on. Atalanta preview. So they haven't played this round yet. And that gives us a little bit of an advantage because we'll have an extra couple of days of rest. They are playing. Uh, Torino tonight mm-hmm. um, and then we play them on Saturday night in Bergamo it's kind of nice to not have a midweek game to be honest and just just have a week to chill out hopefully regain mm-hmm. a little bit of energy but before playing tonight uh, Atalanta are currently in in eighth position in the table they've won six of their opening 13 games and they've lost five of them so there is a chance that if they were to get beat by Torino tonight they uh, they'd have six wins and six defeats but playing us. So um, that early season form that they had has kind of dropped off a little bit. Although if they do win tonight, they uh, would claw level on points with Fiorentina and one behind uh, Roma, who are somehow in fourth place. I Napoli's did not spot flapping. that. 
Um, Flappily are having the yeah. worst title defense since so, Leicester. Atlanta is interesting because it's a team that either smokes us or gets smoked by us. It, it's an interesting one. Looking at their mm-hmm. their their recent form here, obviously the Torino game hasn't happened, so I'm not including that because he can't. But in the ten games they've played since October first, they have dropped points in seven of those. Um, that includes Europa League. You know, it's it's all comps, but that's not a good look. You know, if people are saying we're in crisis, like, my God. Um, and Skamaka is out. Skamaka is injured. So he's going to be missing that game against us, um, which is really a big boost for us because he's probably their most, their their biggest threat, you know, on goal. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a whole lot to say because they have another game to play, so we don't know yet. But they've lost mm-hmm. five times already this season in the league. So let's make it six. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think coming off the back of this win is really important because the team kind of like hopefully has some camaraderie going. The midfield performed great. Mike only let in one goal. Jovic scored. You know, so hopefully uh, we can get all three here. Hopefully one it's thing. one of the ones where we uh, destroy them, right? Yeah. One mm-hmm. thing um, we forgot to mention is – the return of CDK will well, not really the goal. return. It will be the return when he, when they play it. Since you're right, I don't facing even know him again or not, but yeah, yeah. we're we're, we're going to be matching up with him once more. Um, I guess he's only scored the one goal, but he's had two assists. I thought he had scored more. I think he's been playing three. quite a bit though, right? It says twelve Injured. matches. He, he's yeah. Uh, yeah, he's he's had an injury recently though mm. um, that he's come back from, and um, yeah, I think he's. He's got um, he's got a couple of assists as well. But oh, he, he, he had a bit of a hot league. start. He had a bit of a hot start, and then, um, yes, yeah, st- struggled a bit. I, I think with with an injury. Um, but yeah, that I mean that'll be interesting. I I think they're they're a bit of a strange team. Like they they still they still score goals, um, but they're still capable of those results that mean that they don't finish in the top four again. And that's what you come to expect now under Gasparini. I quite like the way that they're built as a team. I think, you know, players like uh, Scalvini, Coop Miners, um, probably any of the strikers would actually get into our team. Um, they're that good. Uh, Edison as well in midfield has been really good. I think he scored like four goals for them. Um, However, yeah, for whatever reason, that uh, struggling, battling a bit with European football and, and and not finding it easy to rotate, they they're just falling short again when they'd probably be looking to challenge for the top four. Um, that being said, I don't think this will be easy. I, I don't think it'll be easy. We're probably not going to start Benacer just because of how long he's been out. It will probably be a thirty minutes off the bench or something. Try dial it up. Uh, the latest is that Liao is not expected to start this either. So. Um, it'll be an off-the-bench thing from him um, if he makes it at all. He's having another MRI tomorrow. Um, and, yeah, we've still got that centre-back crisis because even if Kier comes back, we know he's not going to be at 100%. Um, so do you basically stick with the same team and put Giroud in? I'd keep Jovic in, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, I I probably would too. He's looked a little bit more of like a team player. I. I shit on him every week. I shit on Giroud more. So, like, whoever starts, I'm going to shit on. Yeah, but, shit on um, Keep Giroud off the pitch. Also, you've got, to, you've got to factor in that we've got Newcastle four days after, which obviously mm. we will preview next time. But that, that will factor into the workload management of certain players. So, like, if you start that first choice midfield again, then you want to do it again against uh, Newcastle. That'll be that'll be three times in ten days that the, those players have started. So, um, we might see chances for Adley in this game, or or more minutes for Pobega or or Krunic, who has been a bit of a ghost, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think he's going to rotate a little bit here and there. I think Giroud does come back in just because he's like his comfort blanket and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I had to give a prediction, I'm going to say, well, I think we drop points. I think it's going to be a 1-1. Uh, I'm going to pick a win draw. just to be safe, but uh, it's going to be 2-1 and it's going to be scary till the final whistle. But I think we'll get the win. I, th- I think we'll... <sighs> One of one of the wingers will get a, a goal. Um, one of the three. I don't know who it's going to be. You're saying Leal will be back. Luca to... Romero. Luca Romero. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah, I think we'll win. 
I'm just gonna go with it. I don't have. Any I think it's gonna be two one as well. I want. I want to say a clean sheet, but I just don't see us having a clean sheet right now. Yeah. Hmm. We really should have got one against Frosinone. That pissed me off. Um, mm-hmm. Brescianini as well scoring. Who? who left us in the summer. Um, but yeah, it's uh, let's, let's hope we can get the job done because I think that that would, that would sort of point towards us recovering out of a difficult moment again. I know, I understand people who are kind of pissed off about the notion that like we keep going into these ruts of form. I think we find a way to come out of the other side of it. And like, let's say we were to beat Atalanta, uh, we could potentially pad the lead to fifth place to quite a lot. And <laughs> like, it's like we're on yeah. course to do what we want to this season. And I don't know, it's a bit boring after everything that's happened in the last six weeks since the last break or whatever. But um, yeah, obviously, hope we win uh, against, a, against a rival. Um, let's move on. We got a, a couple of questions to discuss. Um, so thank you to people who sent them in. Um, and I have lost the tweet. That's good. Okay, here we go. So the first one comes from um, Abhijit Mohan. Thoughts on Milan investing in a proper dead ball, dead ball specialist or two? I presume he means player, not set piece coaches. Um, but yeah, so remember like when we signed players. the like top three kick scorer from Germany and Hakan, and neither of them scored free kick goals. That was Hakan fantastic. was the top free kick. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, well, I thought it was. Ricardo Rodriguez. No, nah, it was that his name, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Maybe Rodriguez they were the top two. Unco- yeah, I think you're right. I think they were. I think but they were. We're kind Hakan of was the it. top free kick scorer like in the world when we got him. Mm. Like he was that guy, and then scored one for us his entire five. He scored years one did. from like fifty yards against Dortmund as well. Yeah, uh, it's like down the middle of the goal and knuckleballed it. Look, um, yes, I, dead ball specialists are always nice. Now, I. I, I'm tending more towards we just need to be able to take a corner properly. And I know it might not be the game to to say after, given that we scored from a corner routine and it was really well worked, but like let's make that a trend, not an exception. Um, yeah. we, we waste too many set pieces, like uh, not beating the first man or doing a short corner that stifles all the momentum or going too deep with a cross like Florenzi had a couple of them in the first half where he <laughs> just completely missed everybody. Um, we need consistent quality going into the box. That applies to free kicks as well. I think we do a pretty bad job of choosing which ones to shoot and which ones to cross. Like Often we yeah. line up with good shooting positions and try whip it to the far post. And it's like, what are you doing? The angle's not there. You know, just have a shot and you never know. It could be a rebound or you could draw a corner. Um, even a blocked free kick is still a ball in play. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think choices need to be better. And if we were to go out and sign a new number six, for example, uh, like a Douglas Louise or something like that, I don't know if we could attract him at this point with the money that would be involved. But like if we were to go out and sign a uh, another midfielder, um, if, if Krunic were to be sold, for example, then it would be nice if like a Coop Miners, the... the They'd be a set piece specialist. Um, I think a set piece yeah. coach would be more beneficial because we've got at, one. Apparently, we need a better one. Like him. <laughs> yeah, like, we got a medical staff too. They're not very good. Um, I just think yeah, that just, we have other needs than a uh, Montessori. Yeah, I just look at our our corner kicks, and each one is an outswinger away from the goal. Like you look at you know Teo and Pulisic are lining up on the left sided corner kick each time. That's perfect for Pulisic to swing it in, create some chaos in the box, but then Teo takes them, and then Pulisic takes them without the other person when they're on the right side, and that makes an outswinger again, and you're just like, what are we doing? You know, the the time, the, the goal that was created from the corner was because we took it short to Teo, who then could whip it inward, you know, um, from his position there. So it's like, I don't know, I don't I don't understand what the instruction is. It's something we've been bitching about for at least a season and a half, two seasons now. So I don't know. That that needs to change. I think the instruction is be as least threatening that you can possibly be from a corner situation. Yeah. Um Bidere always goes on about that, and he is actually a coach, albeit a you know, not very serious coach, but um he whips <laughs> he, he goes on so much about like outswinging corners in 2023, and I tend to agree with him on that. Um Mentioned Krunic a second ago. Lab Gorilla asks, you guys happy? Wow, Lab Gorilla's got a new icon. That's very cool. I like that one. You guys happy to sell Krunic? Would you have sold him earlier in the summer for more? He's often been our 
Swiss Army knife. Is that deliberate? I hope that's deliberate, like a Swiss Army knife, that's but a funny. Wish Army knife. If that's true, that's fucking brilliant. Um, filling in that's anywhere funny. on the pitch. Yeah, I, I would have sold him in the summer if we had the time to replace him, but it sounds like Fenerbahce kept coming back with joke transfer fees, mm-hmm. and we're like, no, what's the point? You know? Um, yeah, I think I would have held on to him. The first few games of this season, he was pretty important to us. Uh, he mm-hmm. got us, you know, results in those first three opening games, so... Um, needed him then, don't need him now. Happy to see him go in January if an offer comes through, but we do need to replace him. <laughs> Maybe Ben Asair is a replacement, you know, like a new signing quotations there coming back. So, um, but but in the summer, I would have held on to him for sure. I see, but like when you hold on to him, it gives Pioli an excuse to play him, right? Mm-hmm. But so, we needed him. We didn't have a body. Are you, we needed are you saying he should have taken the decision out of Pioli's hands and just yes. sold him? Because then you you risk having an unhappy coach. And then if the coach is unhappy and says, I'm going to leave, then everyone's happy. So he should have just done that as a power play move. Um, I, look, it, I, as I said, I think it was a timing issue. Like If if they hadn't have dragged their feet over like submitting a, a genuine offer right until the end of the window, then we could have... We could have said, "Off you go. You you got the pay rise. We're not going to offer you as much as they are, um, and we have time to bed in a replacement." Um, in in the meantime, waiting for Ben Asset to come back, but it didn't happen that way, unfortunately. And you can't accept an offer that's way below a player's market value. It just doesn't make any sense. But he's out of contract in 2025, so I think that in January or the summer it will be the right time for him to leave. Uh, 31 years of age as well, so he can go and have his riding off into the sunset moment in Istanbul. Um, and I hope we get a, a, an ambitious replacement. I still see Ben Asser more as a box-to-box player than as a number six, and I know people might... But I we've also been using the double pivot a fair bit, so I think we still need another deeper line player. Samuel Ricci was linked, uh, who is at Torino, and he is really good. I'd like that, but I don't think he comes for less than 40 mil. But if we decide to invest in that position, then I, I think I'd go for uh, for someone like him. But yeah, Krunic, off you go. Um, so Gregory Peck asks... Though it's not too late, are you surprised Carlo Ancelotti never returned to Milan for a second spell like he did with Real Madrid? No. No. No, I think Carlo kind of always talked a little bit of shit about us after his his first spell ended. So I'm not too surprised. I mean, the guy went to Napoli. He went to Everton. Like, I don't know. He, he had opportunities to come back and he chose not to because it was difficult. Um, and then he, he went for money in the Premier League and then he went back to Madrid where it was easy. So I'm not too surprised. Yeah, I I think that if he wanted to come back, he could have. And he still Mm -hmm. can, but, like, also, you know, he's getting older and some of his tactics may not continue to work for a team that is not just built to win without a coach. So, yeah. (laughs) Agreed. Yeah, I I would have liked to have seen him come back at some point, but I do think that the boat is sailing further and further away for it to happen now, especially given that he literally has his next job already um, ready to go. And he's in his 70s now, is he? So it might be a Brazil job and and that's it for him. Um, We'll see. But um, I did always think he'd come back and and I still think that he'd be a good one or two year um, steady the ship, win something kind of guy. Um, However... You know, he, he when you get the opportunity to manage Real Madrid twice and they're giving you that salary and they're giving you that backing in the transfer market, that you know, that's it. Like you can't right. you can't blame him for, for picking that. Um and I on, I honestly don't know if a contract's ever been on the table for him to come back. I, I don't think we'll ever know that. Um but yeah, I think it's a bit of a shame that he didn't come back. But also you can make a really good case that he didn't achieve a lot. No, he achieved stuff, but not as much as he could have done in his first spell with us. Um, so I don't know. It's it's an interesting one, though, is that. Um, final one comes from Sahit Plissi, who asks a few questions. I'm sorry, I'm only going to get to one of them. But what do you think about the Moneyball project in the long run? Do you think we'll be a top European team that competes for big titles again? If not, what should we do to get to that path? I think that it works to like build something. I don't know if we'll work to keep a team built, if that makes sense. Like to get there, it worked. But once you're there, you have to like, I guess the numbers just have to change, right? Like your salary cap has to go up. Your, yeah. like your 
your expenses are going to increase. So like, as long as that model goes up along with the success of the, of the team, then, then it's going to work. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You got to move the goalpost. You know, every, every objective you set, once you hit it, you got to move to something greater. Mm -hmm. And like you said, money's going to have to increase, be it for player transfers, salaries, whatever it is, you know, the budget, it's going to have to go up to maintain or improve. It can get you there. And I think it will get us there, but I don't know if it'll take us to the next level. Um, currently happy with it you know we're seeing financially we're, we're one of the only teams profiting right now in the league and I, I think there's changes to come with how finances are calculated or something like that and yeah ffp is changing and we're the only team in syria i think atalanta is the only other one actually mm -hmm. that, that of the aren't big seven be in trouble yeah. from that yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah i mean in, in that case like I'm glad let's stick to it and, and see what happens afterwards. Maybe, maybe this is the way forward for us in Syria. Who knows? Mm. We did our, we did our bonus podcast last week on the potential of further big sales to come uh, next summer and in following summers. So um, check that out if you haven't already. Um, but I, I do think that there might be a trend of, of seeing an increase in player training. Cause obviously we lost those four players on three transfers that were probably worth like a cumulative 200 million or something in, in market value. We got nothing for. So I do think we'll see the trend continue of selling players. If we get an offer that's irrefutable um, wage bill, as Maddie rightly says is, is it tends to be congruent with success. Like if you want a deeper squad, um, it means that you're paying more top players what what they're worth. You know, ultimately, that's why Inter's is um, ours is two thirds of Inter's wage bill. Uh, Juve's is basically double ours. Um, yeah. Although you could argue their squad's pretty poorly assembled, but yeah, you have to pay for quality depth through wages, uh, especially if they're experienced players. And then as for signings, I think I think our vision's pretty nailed down. You know, we're going to sign players that we hope can become part of a future core that are young. We hope develop and 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 their value raises and stuff like that, um, and and then we're going to sign the odd veteran here and there to kind of, I, I guess, keep some balance to the team and add some leadership and that kind of thing. And that's where we're at. Um, I I think we won the Scudetto too er too early. Like you can never win something too early. We deserved it and stuff like that. But just in in the scheme of the project, because that shifted everybody's expectations to we need to win something big every year. When really the management and the ownership were telling us it's just got to be top four for the next few years until we can mm -hmm. start pushing the boat out with signings. So goalposts need to shift for the ownership, or you could argue that they shifted too much for the fans. Uh, the truth is probably somewhere in between. But I think we all expect for us to um to build on the last transfer window where we signed 10 players for you know over 100 million and, and to keep plugging those gaps in the team um and and to keep getting better like we know a center back's got to come we know a striker's got to come you've got to get those signings right um and and that's what they'll be judged on um as for the money ball thing i mean it's just buying players in the dip and and buying players for for what we think is fair value um it's and i don't necessarily disagree with that um, right, we'll wrap it up there. Just under an hour. Good work. Um, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. Find me on Twitter at Ollie Fisher. By the way, bonus podcast this week is going to be the Maldini quotes. He did an interview with La Repubblica, so we're going to go through it and, and pick out the key bits of what he said. And if we agree, I'll disagree with it. But uh, yeah, be sure to tune into that. And AJ, cheers for joining. Yep, um, always a pleasure. And I should be back next week as well. Yeah, always nice Money. to join. Also, check out our store. We have awesome mugs. It's in the description. Um, get, and deliver it like when, when this is uploaded, delivery should definitely arrive in time for Christmas so you can treat yourself or treat somebody you know um, over the festive period. And yeah, thank you to everybody for listening. We will be back in a week's time. Goal! And Coroteo! It's a miracle! The goal of Hernandez! From one another! It's a miracle!